Later that morning, they walk to the calm side of the island. Mark leads the way with the teenagers, Sonia, Aidan and Ivy. To get to the neighbourhood cove, they walk in single file. The path is flanked by wooden poles painted with creosote. At the beach, the, te the teenagers settle on volcanic rocks that ring the protected bay. Sonia and Ivy spread their towers on hardened lava, flat and smooth. When they lie back, their breasts fall to their sides, straining against the thin bikini tops, the bright flash of a neighbor ring on Ivy's stomach. Aiden is looking at Ivy from under lowered lashes. Laura remembers the teenage dance, the game of limbs tangled underwater. Aiden opens his tackle box and iridescent lures tumble out. As he works, he glances at Ivy, who is lying with a thin arm thrown over her eyes, exposing childlike ribs. He baits the rod, the line arcing in a silver flash over the water. Laura is ashamed of her swollen stomach and veiny thighs. Her leaky body feels old and sad as she settles on the beach, panting slightly and breathing through her mouth, like an old dog. She sits on the folding chair and puts her feet up on the cooler, her eyes closing in the heat, dozing under the blue sky, her eyelashes filtering rainbows. Janine settles next to her, gathering her heavy hair up and into a ponytail. Laura senses her leaning back, turning her face up to the sun. She wants to remind her to wear sunblock, especially on the star-shaped birthmark that always burns. Instead, she thinks of how she can phrase her words. Did mummy ever brew a tea when you had cramps? Laura is drowsy, but she takes care with her words. Chandelier bush, I think. Once. It tasted horrible. I was 16 or 17, Janine says. We can send the kids to find some. I'll brew some for you tonight. It might help clean you out, get rid of all that bad blood. When she opens her eyes, the sun is low in the sky and Janine is drawing a map on a napkin and pointing to the cliff side. Aiden stands watching, opalescent drops of water beating the small of his back. Pick as much as you can, Janine calls as they leave. Late afternoon comes and they have not returned. Laura and Mark mill around the beach, reluctant to leave. But they are old enough, old enough to know how to get home. They are probably at the house waiting. When they arrive, the house is silent in the gloom. Sonia slippers at the bottom of the stairs, her bikini drying on the line. She, at least, has come back. Just behind the mountain, the new moon is rising, a fingernail sliver of light. They didn't go in the boat, says Janine, looking out the window. Even the small skip is here. On the water, the boat is secure and it's mooring. Mark changes his clothes upstairs. When he comes down, he's packed a small torch and a whistle, passing without touching her. From the jetty, she sees where he is going. He is climbing the path to the whale house. Has he forgotten the channel in the side of the cliff? The hidden passage that runs to the heart of the island? Out of the house, Laura imagines swimming. Under the thin moon, the plankton is glowing, shimmering like something alive in the water. Behind their island lies larger Shaka Shikari with the decaying buildings of the abandoned leper colony. Its lighthouse, still powered by an ancient cogged wheel, floated on a circular bed of mercury. She stood here many times under the crops of trees. She counts 13 seconds before the beam sweeps the bay. Through the trees, perhaps, there is a flicker of a candle throwing shadows on the wall. In the rainy season, water runs off the land and cascades into the crevice, flattening the wild orchids that cling to the rocks and making the brackish water sweet. The water appears just beyond the trees, the crack in the seamless wall of cliff only visible if you know where to look. Laura ties the skip, sliding the oars into the sea. She maneuvers the little boat into the stream of water, rowing hard against the current. She rows for ten minutes more, sweating now. Pulls into an alcove with three small steps. Two coconut trees mark the spot, and she ties the skip to the first tree. The climb is not long, but she is winded by the time she reaches the top. The cottage has not changed much. It still stands under the silk, silk cotton tree, its windows shuttered and closed. When she pushes open the door, they don't see her. They are up under the window where the light is green and dim. Aiden is between Ivy's spread honey legs. 
Ivy sees her first and makes a strangled cry, trying to push Aiden off and cover her breast. Aiden climbs to his knees and turns to the door. Behind him, she catches a glimpse of Ivy. The pubic hair waxed to a tiny strip of a neat pink slit, the scent of moist and slick. Aiden's face is shocked, moonlight in the dim light, his pants around his knees. Check with Piru. The Rufus Nightjar calls as she closes the door and runs down the path. Is this what her father saw? When she looks back, she has blown, they have blown out the candle. Someone else can row the skip home, she's tired. After a few minutes, she bears off the path and lies down on the beaten earth. She does not think of the giant centipedes that live on these rocky islands hiding underneath litter. She is too tired to think of them. Far below, she hears the sea as it bucks past the girdle entrance. Laura, Mark is standing over her. The light from his torch had alerted her, but she had stayed silent until he rounded the corner and had seen her. She can see he is torn between worry about Aiden and Ivy and his desire to hold on to his anguish. He dares not voice to her. They're in the wheel house, she says. In the way of marriages, the unspoken flits yellow between them. She had not wanted Janine in the beginning, but that had changed, and it would have been the same with this baby. Baking cakes is not the way you throw a baby away. You think I did it deliberately. You do, but you're wrong, she says. In a moment, she is on her hands and knees, scrambling to her feet. She could tell him now, if there was ever a moment, it is now. But he has walked away, switching off the torch as he goes back down the path. There is no one else to row the skip home, so she rests for a while before going to the boat. The hidden water with its sweetest salt smell rises around her. At the house, Mark says he will cook dinner. She says she will sleep for an hour. They don't touch, but the air is no longer muddy between them. She is still sleeping deeply and dreamlessly when Janine comes into the bedroom. She wakes Laura with soft strokes along her back. Wake up, it's after 10, Janine says softly. The room chill with sea air. This will make you feel better. It will help bring everything down. Janine has brewed a batch of chandelier bush, mamma green in the, in the clear glass. In the dim light, Janine's eyes are liquid. She climbs into bed with Laura, pulling the covers over them both. Laura's firstborn is in bed with her. The smell of the tea is a memory of a mother's suspicion, a mother's blame. I don't understand, her mother had told Laura, this baby wants to be born. It will clean out whatever is left, Janine says, trailing her fingers over Laura's forehead, making such shushing noises Laura's mother always made when they were sick. Before midnight, Laura is doubled over with blinding cramps. On the jetty below, the night line is ringing. Something big is fighting the hook. Laura, calls Mark. What is it? What did you catch? She answers him, matching the excitement in his voice. She knows he will never speak of the baby again. The memory of the nightline comes back to her from her childhood. The things that would surface from the ocean. Once a hundred pound grouper, once a hammerhead shark, with its rows of teeth hidden in its misshapen head. Each one rising up out of the black bay, fighting and pulling on the line, the bell ringing and ringing. By the time she's come down the stairs, they've gutted the shark, an enormous maple with a flat white head and dead gray skin. Come and see. The rows of tiny sharks are alive, wriggling and squirming in the cavity of their mother. He stands behind her, pulling her back to his chest and rocking her, his head on her chin. Her head.